Um, so buffer overflows are when uh, you write a bit of code um, that I get my good markers. So buffer overflow is when you write a bit of code that allocates space for an array, um, and uh, you know I might put anything in here, maybe even like characters. Like let's say I store the characters H E L L O, um, and then the way that C, the way that you use strings in C. Um, it's always an array of characters, but it almost always has um, a, a zero at the end of it. Uh, or sometimes you'll see this represented um, like this. Uh, so if you ever see like a, a character that is backslash zero, it's it's just an actual number zero. Um, so buffer overflow attack is when you you take um, a pointer to this array um, and you send it to somebody else, uh, but you you either don't tell them how long it is. Uh, or you tell them an incorrect length, um, and what they do is, uh, for some reason, they modify the array, um, but then they actually they go past the end of it and start modifying these values, uh, even though you didn't allocate that space, you you never claimed it as yours, um, and yet somebody's still modifying that. Um, so that's what a buffer overflow is, uh, and typically that's a bug. Um, you're you're you'll be messing with other variables that you didn't want to modify, and it might cause your program to crash. Um, but it can be exploited. Um, it can be considered a vulnerability if uh, these are some very specific values that, if they're changed, um, or these are some very specific uh, variables that, if they're changed to very specific values, you could manipulate how the program executes. Um, so let's think of an example um, of a program that might be uh, exploitable um, if you have a buffer overflow vulnerability. Um, so say I have a uh, say I have like a web server um, that uh, you know you can have a, a client computer, right? So this is your your browser. Um, it, it asks the web server for a page, um, say like it asks it for uh, index dot, I don't know, PHP or something. Um, and the web server sends back, um, you know, the page that the browser requested. Um, but what if the web server takes the, the name of the file and copies it into um, let's say it allocates, uh, I don't know, like a thousand elements for a file name, right? Um, and then it takes the file, uh, the file name that it got, and it copies it into this array, right? So we'll have slash index dot html followed by like just a bunch of zeros, right? Um, so that's fine. But what if the name of the file that I give it is really super long? Um, well, then it'll like it'll fill up the rest of the array. Like, what if I give it like .html, you know, astiff, foo, hello, uh, pound, you, right? That's a buffer overflow, right? Um, so the problem with this is that uh, the only way that the browser should ever be able to affect what the server does is by selecting which file uh, the server returns. But by triggering a buffer overflow vulnerability, um, you could be overwriting some other variable uh, in the server. Like maybe this is where the administrator's password is stored. And if you overwrite it, now you can like log into the admin page with the password that you just um, overwrote it with. Uh, so that's, that's an example of um, uh, how it could be exploitable. Um, so you, you can basically, you can cause programs to do things that they weren't intended to do, um, is the basic idea of uh, a vulnerability. Um, so 
Yeah, so let's recap from last week. Um, so last week, you don't really have to like memorize this entire flowchart or anything, um, and the slides will be online later. But um, basically, the two things that we really, or really the three things we really care about um, when we're programming is uh, we care about the source code because that's the most, uh, that's the easiest way for humans to understand what a program is doing. Um, and then through a bunch of compilation processes that eventually gets translated to our program. Um, and that program gets run on the CP, right? Uh, that's, um, you know, just this, you can think of it like a black box, right? Uh, that is really hard to, for, for a human to figure out what it's doing, but for a CPU, it's the easiest way to tell the CPU to do a series of things. Um, so, okay, but what if we want to figure out what it's doing without actually looking at uh, that binary? Well, one of the intermediate steps is called assembly. Um, and, you know, a compiler's job is to translate a program from one language to another uh, while keeping the meaning, keeping the semantics the same. So these should be equivalent programs just in different languages. This is what we wrote, um, and this is uh, a target language, right, um, uh, called assembly. Uh, and th but the nice thing about assembly is that it's, um, there's pretty much like a one-to-one -one correspondence between assembly and binary. Like, there is very little that could be different between uh, assembly for a program and the program itself. Um, so the nice thing is that uh, as humans, it's more readable than binary is. Um, and it's more low level than C source. In, in C, you could just say, hey, I have two numbers, add them together. But in assembly, you have to say, oh, I have this number in this specific address in memory. I want you to move it into this register on the CPU. Um, and then I want you to do the same thing with this other number into this other register. And I want you to add the registers and then write it out to this other very specific place in memory. Um, and you know, when we're reverse engineering a program, that's really important because uh, you know, there might be a vulnerability that's not like a logical fault in the source. Um, so like a logical fault might be like uh, if um, uh, like um, if I don't know some, something stupid even if if password uh, doesn't equal user entered password um, authenticated <laughs> right. So this is saying, like, if the user entered the wrong password, they're authenticated. This would be a very obvious logical error, and we can see it in the source code. Um, but some of the more fine-grained vulnerabilities, uh, it, it's a lot easier to look at the assembly to figure out what's wrong with it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's why we care about assembly in the first place. Any questions so far? Um, oh yeah, so there are two uh, major, you can call them flavors of syntax uh, for uh, representing um, assembly. Uh, and, and this is really for representing um, what's called x86 or x86-64 or sometimes called AMD64 or sometimes called x64. Um, this is uh, Intel's original instruction set that they created back in the 70s um, for their uh, 8086 processor, um, right, Intel 8086. Uh, and then they liked it so much that they used it in their uh, 80186 processor and their 80286 processor and their 80386 processor and their 80486 processor, and they codenamed this one Pentium. Um, so this is, this is a processor that probably a lot of us have actually had computers that had uh, a Pentium chip in it. Um, after the Pentium was like the Pentium 2 and the Pentium 3 and the Pentium 4. Um, and then we've had other chips and we, you know, these days we have, um, you know, we have the core, not the Gore i series, the core, I series chips, right? 
right? So if you ever hear the terms like I3, I5, I7, um, these are modern Intel CPUs, but they all follow supersets of this original instruction set that Intel drafted in the, in the 70s. Um, but they follow a slightly different version of it. Um, so, man, I don't remember what year AMD came out with. So AMD took x86. Um, actually, so Intel, uh, so x86 is 32-bit. Um, uh, that's a 32-bit processor. That means that like all of the registers on the CPU um, can all store 32 bits each. Um, Intel wanted to make a 64-bit instruction set, uh, which just means that the register sizes on the CPU are they can store 64 bits um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of them means that you can address a huge amount of memory. Um, another is that uh, some operations become faster, especially if you're working with really large numbers all the time. Um, so they created, they took their x86, um, uh, which is a 32-bit instruction set, and they made, um, I, I think they called it IA64. Yeah, it was like Intel, Italian, right? Right, yeah. Titanium. Titanium, yeah, exactly. Titanium. Um, and instead of just taking their x86 instruction set and like adding on instructions for 64-bit stuff, they just made it completely different. Um, which obviously the industry didn't really like because a lot of people got used to programming this and then they're like, Intel, why, you, why did you make something completely different? You know, we've been using this for like 15, 20 years. Um, so around the same time, AMD made a competing standard called AMD64, um, which, uh, you know, so if we have uh, x86 instructions, uh, we have IA64 instructions, and there might have been there might have been some overlap, but for the most part, it was a it was a different instruction set. Uh, I'm not actually sure about this, but if if there is an intersection, it, it was really small. Essentially, this wasn't a superset of x86. There are a lot of instructions in x86 that didn't exist in IA64. But what AMD did instead is they made AMD64 a superset of x86. Um, and everybody loved that because it meant that you could take an x86 program, a 32-bit program, and just run it on an AMD64 processor without any modifications. Um, and you could slowly branch out even. Um, so that's, this kind of died. It's still used in a few like, legacy devices, but any 64-bit laptop, desktop you buy today is going to be an AMD64 processor. Um, there's some other, you know, there, there are ARM processors made by a company called ARM. <laughs> um, there are MIPS processors. I don't remember, what's the name of the guys that makes MIPS? Yeah, I should know. You should know? I should know. Um, these are used on a lot of, uh, ARM is used on mobile devices a lot, um, and both of them are used on, like, routers and like IoT devices a lot. Um, so, but laptops and desktops tend to use AMD64. Anyway, um, there's a huge debate, not a huge debate, but there are two ways of writing assembly for uh, x86 programs. Um, and one of them was, it's called the AT&T style, one of them's called the Intel style. I don't know the histories about them because I only care about one of them. Uh, and that sums it up pretty much. Uh, this is <laughs> this is AT and T, and this is Intel. Um, what do some of you guys notice about the differences between the two? Uh, these are it's the same program, by the way, just different, two different ways of writing it. That one's pretty ugly. Pretty ugly, right? You have these superfluous dollar signs, parent or percent signs. Um, yeah, what else? What's what's another thing that looks kind of annoying, maybe? The Q and everything. The Q on everything! Like, every single instruction has, like, an extra Q. Like, what the heck is that? Well, the, the, what this is saying is that it's, it's, operating, it's, it's operating on 64-bit um, values. Instead of uh, the traditional 
MOV instruction, it operates on a 16 or an 8 or a 32-bit operand. Um, so for whatever reason, when AMD 64 came out, the AT&T style, whoever designs the AT&T style uh, syntax, decided to add Q onto everything that operates on 64-bit, whereas Intel was like, no, you can just use the same instructions. The assembler's smart enough to know what you're trying to ask it to do. Um, so just for those reasons, you, Intel's a lot easier to read and to, uh, uh, and to write. Um, but the, the biggest difference between them, which is pretty much personal preference, um, but most people find themselves getting used to one or the other. Um, uh, the, in Intel style syntax, the destination register is the leftmost, and then the source registers are all the rest. Um, whereas on AT&T style syntax, um, the, the source registers are everything except for uh, the last register. So like in this case, the last register is here. Um, well, that's, that's not the same instruction. Uh, here's the destination register, um, and the source registers are everything before it. So this kind of corresponds to C, where like usually in C, the destination, like if you have a function that com like takes a bunch of values, computes some result, and stores it somewhere, you usually put that destination as the first argument, and then all the operands, or all the argument input arguments, or all the rest. So this kind of maps more closely to C. But it's just personal preference in that regard. Um, but you do have to be watching out for that, so you don't get bitten in the butt. Like, wait, why are they moving the value of REX into the number 63? Like, that doesn't make sense. Numbers can't store things. Um, and then I think, yeah, this is just a funny, a funny comment on Reddit. AT&T syntax needs to die in the clear fire. <laughs> and he didn't write it in AT&T syntax, so some guy fixed it for him. <laughs> um, so, okay, and then last week we also talked about uh, the concept of a stack. Uh, who can tell me what, I mean, if you didn't see this right here, what, what's a stack also called sometimes? Last and first stack? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, sometimes it's called a, a LIFO, last in, first out, or a what? A push pop. A push pop. The little, little. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I got one of those now. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's also called a filo <laughs> or philo, first in, last out. Basically, the two things you can do on a stack are, um, you know, it, it's basically an array of elements. Uh, or, I mean, it doesn't have to be an array. It's some sort of sequence of elements um, such that you can add an element on uh, or remove an element. Um, but in order to. This is tough, like, because, okay, so when you push an element on, you can think of it as, it, 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 it has like a top, right? It has a current top. And when you push an element onto it, you basically uh, move that top, you, you give it some room, and then you copy that element, right? So this thing is getting copied into this place. And then when you pop an element off, uh, you, you take this and copy it somewhere else, and then move that top back down to where it was. Um, so that's pushing and popping. And this, this diagram really kind of sums it up very well. Um, these items look like they're being added on top of the stack, and then popping is removing the top items off. Um, but the, the basic concept, concept of a stack is that the, the oldest items um, don't get removed until the ones newer than them do. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what a stack is. Um, the opposite of that is a queue, where you can add items onto it, and then the, when, you ask it, when you ask it to remove an item, it removes the oldest item um, instead of the newest item. Um, so that's just what it is, and then why is that important to what we're doing? Uh, OK, yeah. This kind of explains it. So. When I'm in main and I want to call this other function, well, actually, let's say I'm. Let's say that main has like a couple variables, int a, b, c, um, and I call do hello that also has like an int a, b, c. Uh, well, if I wanted to store something here and then call this function, do I want the 
this functions a, b, and c to be the same as this a, b, and c? Should they refer to the same? Oh, no, no, right? Yeah. Um, that's why we call these local variables, right? Because they're local to this function. It means that nothing else should be able to touch it unless I pass a pointer to it um, to someone else. Um, so that means that whenever we call a function, we need some way of saving all of our current values. Um, so the way that uh, Linux programs do this is that whenever a function is called, um, there's a global stack. Uh, and whenever a function is called, it knows how many local variables it has. So in this case, three. Um, and it knows the size of each of these variables ahead of time. So, I mean, the compiler knows that. Uh, so when a function is called, it makes some space on the stack for its, let's say, like local variables, right? And this is like, this is main. This, um, the frame. Right, so this is A, B, and C in main. Um, and then any time it wants to call another function, um, it calls that function, and then that function makes some space for itself for, for its local variables. Um, do you have a uh, frame? All right, so that's, um, and then once do hello is done, what do you think it's gonna do with all of its, all of its variables there? Pop them off. Pop them off, exactly. Um, so you can think of it as, I, I pushed on some space onto our stack for do hellos A, B, and C. And then when do hello is done and it's gonna return, I need to pop them off um, so that that space isn't wasted and that main can then access its A, B, and C. Um, so how's this done? Uh, so um, in, in C, when, when we're about to enter main, uh, we have this register called um, RSP if you're on 64 bit, um, or uh, ESP in 32 bit mode. Uh, but whichever one it is, um, basically it points just below uh, the start of the stack. Um, and this is the case for RSP and ESP always. They, they point at the topmost item in the stack. Uh, and when you have no items, you represent that by it points below the stack. Um, and then when main uh, wants to push A, B, and C on the stack, uh, what it does is it executes an instruction, and th this is an oversimplification, but um, say it, it says push five, uh, what that does is uh, the processor will increment, or it'll move RSP up the stack by one element, um, so it points here, uh, and then it'll store the operand of that instruction at that point. Um, and then it can push four, and the same thing happens, we move the stack, right? Oh, SP stands for stack pointer. We move the stack pointer up one and then store a four there. Um, and then same thing like push three, move the stack pointer up an element, right, move up an element, and then store three. All right, so that's concretely how we store values on the stack. And then if we want to pop them off into a register, we say pop, and then we give the name of the register, um, like let's say RAX. Uh, if you weren't there last week, we have four um, general purpose registers. And then a few others that are also used really commonly, um, RDI, RCI, RSI, and then, um, R8 through R11 or 12. Does anybody remember? Well, you definitely have R8, 9, 10, 11, um, but it might go higher than that sometimes. Um, that's in 64-bit that's in mode. And then in 32-bit mode, um, all of all of these are the same, except uh, to get rid of the R and make it an S. Or, I mean, make it an E. So you have E, A, X, 
you know, to EDX if EDI and ESI. Um, but yeah, so the pop instruction takes the name of a register, and then what it does is it looks where the stack pointer points, um, copies it into that register, and then moves the stack pointer down one. Um, and so note, this is this is really a copy, right? So it doesn't it doesn't change the contents of memory at that location, even though this is now considered outside of the stack, right? Typically, we don't want to care about stuff that's higher up the stack than the stack pointer. So a lot of times we'll just erase this because it's now deallocated, but there's like there's a ghost of a three living there still. Um, that's important in some advanced challenges sometimes. Um, so that's how the stack works. Questions? Okay. Um, now I know I know like this stuff will get pretty deep. Um, it can get overwhelming, um, but like practicing in CTFs um, and honable.kr. Uh, honable. Kevin showed me this. This is an awesome site that just 24 7 has uh, portable challenges that you can download. Um, and then it gives you uh, credentials to a server. You log into the server and try to um, hone that uh, program. Um, what's, what's China's version of that? Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen that. I know there's a pwnable.vn, I think. VN? That has a uh, tall shell code. Uh, okay. I think it's VN. I'll check real quick for you. Yeah, there, there are a few sites that basically just have 24-7 CTFs going on. Um, and you can just download the programs and potentially the source code, figure out what's wrong with them, exploit them, and gain imaginary internet points. And knowledge. <laughs> points, though. But the points. Yeah. Everything's made up. Points don't matter. <laughs> um, if you can do, oh, it's TW is the one with all the shell code. OK, so. If you can do the challenges on Honorable.kr, you're like set for CTFs because they start to ramp up in difficulty. Yeah, uh, and if you can do them, you know you're you're good to go for challenges. Yeah, the, the Honorable.kr separates it into like difficulty levels. Baby's bottle is the first level of difficulty, and it's not actually a baby's bottle. Yeah, that's despite what they call it. I wouldn't call it easy. <laughs> I mean, if you if you like have experience with all of this and you you find the vulnerability right away, maybe it won't be challenging, but it'll definitely not be easy. You, even if you know exactly what's wrong with it, you still have to work to find the solution. Um, that being said, if it's your first time with uh, CTFs, it will be challenging, on vulnerable. Um, but you can definitely learn some awesome stuff with it. Um, so that being said, so we know how to push stuff on a stack and pop stuff off. So let's get function calling actually working now. Um, so I, I want to call do hello, right? And let's say that this is what main's stack frame looks like. Um, so the very first thing that I need to tell do hello is where to return to. Because my main is really simple right now, but if it has more code later on, after do hello is done, after, when it wants to return, it, it needs to know where to go, right? Because normally, like, the CPU will just execute instructions one after one, one one after the other, right? So, like, in this case, if do hello just, like, doesn't return, we might, like, re-enter main from the start, and that's obviously not what we want to do, right? Um, so we need to tell do hello somehow would return. So in that case, that's, uh, you know, whatever follows right after the, the call to do hello, right? Um, so let's call this our return address. Um, and let's just store that on the stack, I guess. Um, return address. Right, so you can think of this as like, a, um, th there's another register called uh, RIP. Again, you know, 64 bit calls it RIP, 32 bit mode calls it EIP. Uh, and that Points, you know, so if we have our instruction screen like push five, push four, push RIP, push three. Um, RIP, when you're executing the instruction, 
always points at the beginning of the next instruction um, on x86. Uh, on other architectures, it might work differently. Um, but the instruction pointer on x86 always points at the next instruction while you're executing the, the current one. Um, so that's a problem uh, because what if what if we wanted to do something like um, push RIP call do hello? Well, what will happen is, um, and then let's say so. Let's say that this is what main does, and then let's say that do hello uh, it does some stuff, and then it um, pops that value that we pushed on into the register RIP. You can't actually do this on x86, um, but let's just assume we could. What will happen is main will push, where will RIP point to when we execute this instruction? Yeah, the call do hello, right? RIP will point here. So we'll, we'll push pointer to here, and then we'll jump into do hello. It does its stuff. And then it pops this value off in the RIP, which would return to here and call do hello again, which is not what we want. We want it to return here, right? Um, so instead of having this uh, push followed by a call in x86, um, it's wrapped up by, well, <laughs> actually, um, let's call this a jump. <laughs> um, uh, because these two are bundled into one instruction called call. <laughs> um, so we wouldn't write this. Uh, instead, it would be just call do hello, um, followed by the rest of main's code. And then do hello would do some stuff, and then execute this instruction called ret. Um, so what do these do? Call does basically what we saw before, except now it's only one instruction. Now RIP will point here when we execute this. That's great because call hello, or call do hello, um, it'll push RIP. That's what, so the call instruction, it pushes the current value of RIP, and uh, after that it jumps to wherever we tell it to jump, all in one instruction, which means it'll push RIP. So now our return address will point here. Um, and then it'll jump to wherever we told it to jump, right? So now it'll jump here, execute do hello, and then what the ret instruction does um, is in one, I mean, you can think of ret as um, equivalent to pop RIP. Uh, even though this technically isn't valid, that's basically what ret does. It takes um, wherever RSP points, um, it copies the value that it points to uh, into the instruction pointer, and then moves RSP down one. So that's how you call functions um, on x86. Uh, and but then today I wanted to quickly talk about how you pass arguments into functions in assembly. Uh, but before I do that, questions on this because I know there probably will be some. All right. Um, these slides, I mean, it's in the link that I posted, so if you ever want to come back uh, to it. Oh, that's right. I, I guess I stepped through it last week, but uh, I'm running a little short on time. So I'll skip this for now. Um, but you can you can step through this animation um, and see exactly what happens on the stack. Um, so, okay. Uh, so, we figured out how to call functions, but we don't know how to pass arguments into them yet. Um, so, on x86-64, or AMD-64, or whatever, uh, before we execute that call, uh, so let's say we want to instead, um, we, you know, we have our main, and it wants to call this other function with one, two, and three. Um, and then we have this, we have a void f, it takes an int a, int b, and an int c, and then 
let's just say it returns five. Um, so before we call f, we need to store its argument somewhere. Um, the way that x8664 does it um, is it, it, it has these registers, um, RDI, RSI, RDX, R6, R8, R9. Don't have to memorize them. You can Google it or free the slides or whatever. Um, and it stores the first six arguments here. So in our case, one, two, and three, uh, we would store these here, here, and here. Um, what does that look like in assembly? It's move, um, so, I don't know, can anybody fill in the blank? What are the two operands to the move so that we copy one into A, or one into RDI? RDI is the destination, right? RDI is the destination, so Intel syntax, uh-huh. And then A is the what's being moved? Yeah, so A is what's, what's being moved, but it's just a, a constant value of one. Sure. So the compiler would probably use that constant value. Um, so the one, right? Mm -hmm. And then same thing, so move RSI2, and then move RDX3, right? Um, so that's how x86-64 handles it. Um, and then we would call f. And then, so this is what main does. And then f, uh, what it does is it returns five and I don't think it shows it in this diagram, um, but on both x86, 64, and just x86, um, the way to return a value is you remove, you move the value you want to return into AX. If it's 64-bit or AX, if it's 32-bit EAX, um, you remove, or so, and yeah, so what would we want to return? Five, right? So we move the value five into RAX and then return. Right, so um, on a 64-bit CPU, um, this would look like that. No, I mean, it wouldn't because this is void. You can't return the number from the void. <laughs> but if we make an int, mm -hmm. now it would look like that. Yes. Questions? OK. Um, the 32-bit version is even simpler than that, actually. Um, I don't like diagrams like this uh, because I forgot to tell you, but the so the, the stack, I always draw it so when you push something, you add on top. When you pop something, it removes from the top. And that's the, the typical way in computer science you draw this. But for whatever reason, Intel decided to make this a high address and this a low address, which seems fine, right? Because typically, like if you're reading something, you think like low should come before high, you're reading it top to bottom. But the problem with this is that when you push something onto the stack, RSP actually gets small, right? Because to move up the stack, you have to decrease the value of RSP. Um, so because that's kind of confusing, some people will draw their stacks upside down and say, oh wait, no, this, I'm sorry, this diagram's fine. Um, higher address at the bottom, lower address at the top. That's how, uh, you know, when you're talking about poning binaries, this is the easiest way to think about things. Um, so, remember how on 64-bit version, uh, the first six values would get passed in registers? I didn't tell you that um, arguments seven and beyond, we would push those onto the stack, uh, right to left. Uh, well, x86 is a little bit simpler because it just pushes everything, right? So we, if we have our function called f123, we would just push the values onto the stack, so push three, push two, push one, and then call f. Um, so this is even simpler because you don't even have to count Oh, is it one of the first six arguments? Well, I threw a new register. Oh, is it seven or beyond? I push it. Um, x86 just pushes everything. Um, it's a little more inefficient. That's why they decided to um, pass the first six arguments by register. But that's all. So we, we push our arguments and then we call. Um, so 
Okay, so we figured out how to call functions. We figured out how to call functions with arguments. Last week, I showed you guys how to um, how to pwn, how to use a buffer overflow vulnerability um, to re essentially return into a, a function that you weren't supposed to be able to execute. Um, and last, that was. Slack just um, what did that look like? Oh yeah, that's right. It's on a previous slide. Um, so last week that looked like this. We have this function called super secret shell that if this ever gets called, it um, it gives us shell access to the system. Um, and yet this function is never called uh, in our program. Um, but, uh, so remember when we, when we call do hello, the first thing it does is it makes room for its local variables, right? And if somehow, uh, remember the buffer overflow vulnerability, if somehow we get do hello or someone else to um, write past the end of this array into the return address, um, if we can write a very specific value, um, that means that we could, for instance, write the address of super secret shell. Um, so that when do hello executes the ret instruction, it'll pop this off the stack and return return to that address, which ends up executing our super secret shell. Um, so last week, I showed you how you can overwrite the return address. Um, uh, of, a, of a function on the stack uh, to return to some bit of code that will give you uh, enhanced privileges or, um, in this case, shell access. Um, basically something that the program wasn't supposed to do. Uh, like maybe um, a, a more reasonable case is like if um, password good Uh, then authenticated, else um, error. So this is a little more reasonable, right? Um, so this is like some function. I haven't given a name yet. Um, so if the user typed in a good password, they're authenticated, they can do whatever. Uh, otherwise, return an error. So that's, that's kind of reasonable. Um, but the problem is that uh, if the function like earlier on had like an array allocation, um, and then let's say it points it, or it passes that, or a pointer to that array to this function, if somehow we can get the program to, uh, you know, say that in this case it's not name but it's password, if we can get the program to write what it thinks is legitimate data past the end of password, we can overwrite return pointer. So this function will call error, but as long as error returns, when we return, we could return to anywhere. Even like, maybe I point this at the authenticated function. Um, so it'll print out an error, but then after that, it'll give us a shell or something. Um, so that's if there exists code in the program that we would want to force the program to jump into, that's how you would use a buffer overflow vulnerability to gain uh, control of the program. Um, but what if there isn't any code uh, in the program that is interesting? Uh, so earlier we saw uh, a Traditional stack overflow, or a, what do they call this? this is a stack overflow attack. Um, it's a buffer overflow attack. Um, so we would overwrite the return address somehow uh, so that when the function returns, we can get it to go somewhere that we, that we control or that would give us control or something like that. Um, but in a, uh, in a different kind of attack, we might want to keep writing past the end of the return address um, and put code there 
Uh, in the past, we've only been storing data on the stack, but I mean, you know, code is just uh, all, all this assembly, right? Um, we saw earlier gets uh, compiled into binary, right? Um, so you know, it's code is data. Uh, so we could figure out, we could compile a program of our own, take that binary, and then shove it into the other program as data. Um, uh, so we could store code on the stack, um, and then we can get um, the return address to point to that code, um, so that when we return, where would we be returning into? We'd be returning into this code. Um, and what would happen, that means this code starts getting executed. So we could put arbitrary code on the stack and get the program to return into that code. Um, so this is code that didn't exist in the original program, but we injected it uh, into the memory space of the running program. Um, so this attack is called a stack smashing attack. And now I can erase a fix, right? So it's, it's called a stack smashing attack. Um, uh, yeah, geez. Okay, so that took about 55 minutes. I wanted to kind of show what a stack smashing attack looks like, but I also wanted to get everybody started on ICTF. Um, so I think next week I'll just I'll show everybody what um, uh, how to how to pull off a stack smashing attack. Um, so sorry there wasn't any uh, hands-on demo this time. Um, but I really want to oops, start playing my CTF because um, I think this would be really great for everyone. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so let's do a team of two teams of three and a team of two. I guess. Okay. I already signed up for that. Helps. You already signed up? Okay, so teams, two teams of three, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, um, so let's do the three of you on a team and the three of you on a team. Um, so if one person from each team could go to uh, ice or, no, ice.c.tf. Sheesh. <laughs> um, and I actually haven't, oh, I think I just did something. Uh, <laughs> I swear it's legit. Stop, bro. Jeez. Yo, that last pass there. So, I guess you guys get to see my like first 20 characters of my 100 character Whoa. password. So, okay, actually, I guess everybody needs to make an account, I guess, and then what you invite people to your team, is that how it works? Yeah. Okay. Um, but I guess once you do that, I think if you click ICTF, you can view the board that we want. Okay. Okay, I'll just make a. When you finally do join the team, they just leave you on this page. And there's no, like, compete button. Aw, which is annoying. <laughs> Oh, I'm in 663rd place. Wow. I've done nothing. <laughs> cool. Uh, Are these names be seen by anyone? Probably. At I least my team. Yeah, I, team I, I team. think they appear in the leaderboard. Do okay. they? Okay. Cool. I haven't confirmed that for myself, but I know that they have a leaderboard of like. Well, everybody else be seen by anyone. I, I have to know. Don't oh, think so. Be. Cool. Um, so. Oh, are they doing like. It it's a bit different. Academy. It's kind of awful, in my opinion. You, you really? can't see like who solved what no. or anything like that. So you, you just see the top challenges 10. as you go. Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, okay. okay, I can see. 
Okay, so you can um, do all the challenges right away. Yeah, I, I think that's all the challenges. There just aren't many in each category. Yeah. So and they don't tell you who solved it or anything like that. That's silly. Yeah, yeah there are um, no stats. On that. So this this is this looks like a very minimalistic or like hit start. Okay. Um, other CTFs are usually a little bit simpler, but they give you more info. I don't know. This is just a little bit different. Um, but it's it's similar to other CTFs in that like there will be like a board with categories, and then you'll have challenges within those categories. Like in this category web, we have uh, we only have one challenge so far. Okay, start. Um, code cat. Oh jeez, are you serious? <laughs> Literally is code cat. Okay. They used a, a we use they used that a platform giant called button to download things. Adversary or something. Which also takes you to the website. Okay. Um, <laughs> so not an endorsement. <laughs> there's something wrong with this website besides its content. I, I'm not I falling on either side here. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So web challenges. There will be some vulnerability baked into the website. Thanks. Um, Thanks. 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 I like it. I like it. Um, I'll, you know, it, I I would really Definitely be interested to see like. Sometimes, like there will be, uh, like people can make blog entries and then other people can read them, and like sometimes they'll have like blog IDs. Like, so I wonder if there's anything in here with like, as far as I can tell, this has nothing. That's blog number four twenty. Uh, <laughs> hey. Oh. Well. Yeah, I don't know. I'm really bad at web challenges. Um, uh, that's a good idea. It was slash There is a hello world under under miscellaneous that yeah. If you want to solve kind of starts you. Okay. Shows you the format. Is that just is that like kind of easier? Well, it's just uh, yeah, it's just trivial. No, it's pretty hard. Oh, it's ten points. It's it's going to be extremely hard, right? <laughs> I don't think there's anything to download on that one. Oh, okay. Oh, welcome. Let me zoom in a little bit. Welcome. Um, all flags. Oh yeah. So in a lot of CTFs, um, uh, the the ultimate goal um, is to drop a flag, right? Capture the flag. Um, so we have these strings called flags, and a lot of times they'll follow a format like flag. Uh, I don't know. Never. Looks like really bad. Three. Never. Use uh, I don't know PHP or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so a lot of times they'll look like that, um, or instead of flag, it might be like you know whatever CTF, whatever the name of the CTF is. Um, and most CTFs will tell you what the format for the flag is. So they say it's ICTF curly brace um, secret message and then a curly brace. Um, and then they tell you how the specific CTF works, um, and then for this challenge, they just they give you the solution to the challenge. So you say, oh, I, I got the flag. I don't know how I got it. That was really challenging. Um, <laughs> you can write a review. Five I stars. Uh, although simplistic in nature, it this challenge is quite edifying. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, right? I don't think that's how you spell edifying, but whatever. Your review was received. Um, so let's see, is there, let's just see if there's like an easy... That's the one I'm working on. Pokemango? Yeah, it's, the, it's an Android one. 200 points yeah. might not be that hard. I stumbled upon a strange website. Um, it's made by flower enthusiasts, but it's taken over by someone or something. Can you figure out what it's trying to tell us? Nothing, because I can't click on it. Oh god. Um, oh no, no. Oh, no. you've been hacked. Send us Bitcoin! <laughs> <laughs> this challenge makes me want to cry. Attach <laughs> princess. Fail. Okay, wow. Uh, what happened to this? Countdown. Okay, we have 195,000 seconds. All right. How, wait, how? 
how long is that? That's like five fifty hours. So, one hundred thirty-five days. No, that appears, well, to be the long, long, that appears to be the days, though. It's the second. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wait. Seconds, sure. minutes, hours, days. Oh, okay. okay. Well, we have a really long time to solve this challenge, cool. I guess. <laughs> um, but oh, yes. with web challenges, one of the first things you do is you look at um, the source code for it. Um, in, in Chrome, you can right-click, inspect, uh, or Control Shift I is the shortcut for that. Um, and uh, this is this is a two hundred point challenge, so it's probably not trivial. Um, but I don't know. Let's let's look at this element specifically. Um, okay. They're just like these weird. They look like <laughs> shell commands, but they're not. Um, and we have a link to a script. Um, so, takes the current day, India time. Is that some global? IST is about eight hours off ish. I mean, it's like 7 p.m. there is my day in here. Yeah, okay. There we go. So I guess the idea is that this challenge was taken over by some hacker in India or some guy trying to look like a hacker from India, I guess. Um, takes the difference between them. Uh, it looks like it's just counting down, but there might be some logical error with this. Like there might be some weird edge case that it skips a second or something silly. Um, but this looks like all it's doing is if you, running out the countdown. If we go in back to the page and change the counter variable yeah. to zero or something. India time. India time. Oh, what is it? Is it date time? I don't know JavaScript. New date. Zero. So we know it stops at zero. Um, it doesn't seem to do anything visibly interesting, but that doesn't mean that it's not doing anything interesting at all. Um, I guess if it did it, it could have been hmm. interesting, we would have seen it in the code. So. <laughs> hmm. I don't know if this is an error with the challenge itself, um, but for whatever reason, it requested a GIF from the server, and the, the server said that, that GIF doesn't exist. Yeah, all of the uh, all of the links give that. Oh, really? Like if you click on about or home or gardens, oh, yeah, it gives there. you that. That's bizarre. It well, is. I fixed but, it. I fixed it. I just deleted it yeah. my box. But yeah, um, it's hard to know whether or not that's uh, part of the challenge or if that's a mistake. Um, like yeah, I, I was really kind of hoping there'd be like a really easy, like just intro, like clinical challenge. Um, so, I mean, again, so these look like they might be challenging, um, but doable. Uh, so forensics is like basically um, uh, somebody has I don't know we, we got some file off some guy's <coughs> computer but he like wrapped it in a bunch of layers of uh, zip files and he like modified an image so it stores text in it um, and I mean I guess that would be more steganography but but it's basically like Oh. There's data in this, and we need to we need to figure out what the data is. It looks like it might just be the yeah, uh, like what individual swing individual layer like layering them all on top of each other. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. uh, let's uh, get get. There's a way to open 
Many to learn how to do Drunk these board. challenges. What is it? From the order. I thought you could. Oh, here. Oh. Open from the order. Ah, screw it. Yeah, copy. Weapon. I can't tell you. Oh, okay. Well, that's I guess I can just move it in here. Could it? Oh my gosh. Download. Uh, let's see. So when you Google anything GIF, it just gives you that thing GIF. So I'm Googling with Latin unroll GIFs, and it's just giving me like paper on oh, really? and shit. Like, this is a difficult thing to search for. Interesting. How to um, roll. I thought there's a way... That, that cannot be determined. Oh, I, I want to convert all of these... Let's do colors. Um, what's color to alpha. Yeah, why can't I color? Oh, I need to add an alpha channel. Basically, in order to solve a challenge like this, like you just need to know how to like screw out, screw around with uh, image manipulation stuff, I guess. Um, oh, I need to remove the alpha channel. So basically, what I'm doing with this is I want to. Why can't I call it alpha? I want to try converting everywhere where it's white to invisible. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's this is done. Um, delete. I don't have enough to know anymore. Delete. Okay. So let's try with the next layer. Um, everywhere there's white, delete. Nice. White, delete. Can you select both layers? I wish I could. Um, <laughs> I, well, I wonder. Uh, it's literally just on that um, like panel and ship like multiple layers at once. I couldn't. No. And then you would no. have to select the white on that layer, though. Yeah, I guess. Same. But you could write a script to do it, because um, there are like hundreds of layers, and this could get kind of annoying. Um, but I'm just looking for like any sign that this is the right way to proceed. Seems like it. And. I don't know. Yeah, it might be. Some things seem to kind of line up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That lined up, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, cool. Pretty sweet. I don't know if it's faster to write a script to do this or. Yeah, and you're like halfway done already. Not really. <laughs> um, but this seems to be the right solution. So, if anybody feels like. Pretty much. I could imagine that starting to spell ICTO. <laughs> you think? Yeah. Oh, God. That's probably faster than this. Mm. Finding a way to make the GIF go way faster. Oh, true. I don't know. This might yeah, not be right. Um. Oh well. Oh no no. I see ice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ice CTF. So yeah. I guess that's probably it. And Those colors are probably anomalies. Like just probably. to I guess, throw you off. Actually, we actually kind of are like halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we definitely were not halfway through. Nice. Nice. This is a tough screw. Ah, <laughs> uh -huh. Lee hacker right there. Oh, just, no, I don't want to reorder this. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. This is like. I can't put it between this. <laughs> yes. If you had some sort of like image filtering script, you could tell it to replace yes. all the white and transparent. Yeah, who's right? really good with those? Yeah. Bad things. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's good with those. Um, there are like Python libraries and libraries in other languages um, for image manipulation stuff. A really good one for Python is called Pillow. Um, so I would literally just be able to loop through all of the layers. Um, wherever there's something that's white or really close to white, just change it to completely transparent, merge all the layers into an image and export it, and then I'd be able to view it. Um, but it actually probably honestly take about the same time to write that as it does to just manually do it. Um, if this were like a thousand layers, <laughs> um, obviously that'd be way faster. How many layers is this? A lot? <laughs> uh, <laughs> 67. Uh -huh. um, so this is ICTF wow, wow fast? Wow. Is that what it says? Wow, Ethan. Keep 
Yeah, I guess while fast. Wow fast. All right. Yep. I can't tell if it's an ice or a once, but they did say in the rules that it would be ICE. So let's try that, I guess. So I guess I like technically cheated because like we're not supposed to share flags across teams, but um, since I haven't joined a team yet, <laughs> I mean, Cobalt was like yelled out like the map like so. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that's like uh, you'll see some. Uh, what was this? Forensics? This could be forensics, or this could be uh, another category called steganography. Um, but steganography is more focused on. Um, uh, yeah, some is there? Um, stego is like hiding data in plain sight. Um, forensics, is, forensics and crypto is more focused on just hiding data. Uh, it doesn't matter if it looks like I've hidden data or not. Um, stego, we want it to look like. It's just a normal thing. Look, this just looks like a picture, right? Like, it looks like Mr. Robot, right? Um, but somewhere hidden in this is data. Um, or let's go to Stego 2. Um, download more mail. Nope. This is even crazier. Like, Down the rabbit hole, it's probably a bunch of images hidden inside. Oh, images. yeah, maybe. Yeah, definitely, because you know, onions have layers. <laughs> <laughs> Confirmed. Half the next three. one's probably like a picture of Shrek or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's impressive. Like you really, I'm just looks like a JPEG. Um, but the thing with so like JPEGs, everybody knows what JPEG is, right? It's a picture format. It's called a lossy compression format, which mm -hmm. means like when you compress it, you lose information. Um, and you can kind of see that like here. You see, there's some like weird colors. I don't know how visible it is, especially with the whiteboard erasing. Um, Yeah, that's not really that visible, I guess. Um, but the, the, the problem with JPEG is once you compress an image using JPEG, like what used to be perfectly white, if it's like right next to a different color, like that pixel might be changed or something. So there are a lot of imperfections in JPEGs that um, if you could just change each pixel by like one bit and a human wouldn't notice, which means that you can use all those pixels to really sparsely store data. Um, on them, uh, and it changes the colors slightly, but a human wouldn't really be able to notice those changes. The computer file videos on JPEG are really, really good. Really? Yeah. They explain pretty solidly yeah. how it works. Yeah. It, it basically destroys a ton of data, but for the most part, for our general use, we don't really care. Yeah. Are you here for white matters? Yes. Awesome. Um, so I just, I just got wrapped up. Um, uh, with my talk, but I posted the slides. Um, are you on our Slack? Yes, I'm Kenneth. Oh, okay, oh, awesome. Yeah, so I posted a link in um, exploitation meeting. Okay. Um, and then uh, I was just introducing um, ICTF that just started today. Um, I think it goes for approximately a week. Um, so yeah, I totally encourage everybody to play in it. Um, and it's it's better when you're a team, um, and that that doesn't mean that you guys have to like find when y'all are available and like come to school or anything. Because a lot of these things, you know, you can just chat um, on Slack about it. Like, hey, you know, I'm working on this challenge. I'm stuck on this one part. Um, you mind taking a look or something? Um, but we'll send out an announcement. Some of us might be meeting up over the weekend to, to play ICTF a little bit. Yeah. And then definitely next week is one of the biggest CTFs um, that we love playing in. That's Seesaw CTF. Um, that's for Cybersecurity Awareness Week. Um, and the, the qualifications for that are uh, next weekend. Um, Friday at what is that, 2, 2 p.m.? No. Midnight on 4? 4 p.m. Right? Yeah. Eight. Oh, sorry. No, it's UTC. Or, but uh, yeah, local time though, right? Yeah. So it's eight p.m. UTC or eight p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, which I think is four p.m. here yeah. in the summer, right? Um, but anyway, it runs for um, forty-eight hours over the weekend. So definitely next weekend we'll be meeting up in the in the hack space um, to to work on that, and that's um, hack space. So the okay, the hack space is 
I've heard this like mentioned a few times when I. Not That's where the elite hackers hang out. So we're here in EMB, right? Let's go sell it. So we're here in EMB, right? You can cross um, Colin, that's the big road out there, Collins Boulevard, and this is the library. Mm -hmm. um, go past the library. Uh, this is the education building where we have our Friday meetings. Um, and then just northeast of that is uh, the faculty administration office. It's, uh, that's not where the hack space is. That's, that is where the hack space is. <laughs> um, FAO, uh, this is the FAO building. Um, and then the exact room number, I can never remember, but it's posted in the Slack channel 168. 168. Thanks. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you go to Hackerspace on Slack, uh, I think. Nope. Topic does not say the room number. Um, I have it on the site. I should say FAO 168. <laughs> um, I'll even. It's approximately here ish. <laughs> you should submit a location to Google to get on the map. Oh, we should. <laughs> and then you can make it part of your CC. Absolutely. Yeah, you can do, you can do a recon. Yeah. <laughs> like that one where they made you find a... Were you... Yeah, that, well, the, I was the one that tried... The Worcester one? Or where one? you had to find the bridge in oh, no, Japan? Not, no. Oh, not that one, no. No, oh. the one that I participated in, you had to actually be on that college's campus to solve it. Oh, and really? I kept trying to solve it on Google Maps, and I, I was mad when I found that out. <laughs> oh. For one CTF challenge, they, did, they gave you a picture of a bridge, and you had to go and find the name of the bridge. <laughs> Oh, that's right. And it's some yeah. tiny little bridge. It's like maybe 20 feet wide. A little tiny thing in the middle of nowhere in Japan. And they, they gave you the I GPS coordinates, unfortunately. Oh, true. Um, but yeah, totally encourage everyone to play ICTF. Um, and uh, yeah, tomorrow we're meeting um, back in EMB. Two. Um, so, you know, we have our normal Friday meetings, uh, but those are more like general body meetings. Um, and those, a lot of times, will have like industry speakers or, uh, you know, somebody will talk about some random topic related to cybersecurity. Um, and then we have this room Thursdays, uh, 5 to 6 30 um, from now on. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, unless something goes wrong, like, I'll always have a meeting on Thursdays, but um, definitely, if you guys haven't already, let's see if the website's still down. All right, I gotta figure that out, but um, is anybody not on our mailing list? Probably not. Probably not? Okay, so... Nope. Um, just gotta go to my email. <laughs> um, yeah, there we go. Um, so I can drop this in our channel as well. Sure. In packet exploitation meeting, um, so you can uh, you can give this mailing list uh, an email ad address to use, and all of our announcements always go out to the mailing list and Bullsync, um, and the website when it's back up. But, uh, but yeah, definitely at least the mailing list. So, but yeah. That's it. Um, Society of Competitive Programmers, uh, which is another student organization, um, just started a meeting at like 6 p.m. and they're like trying to build a website right now. I think they do a lot of hackathons. Um, <coughs> if anybody is interested in like uh, more 
you know, trying to build something as fast as possible. You know, CTFs, we like try to break stuff <laughs> in 48 hours, and hackathons try to build stuff in like 48 hours. Um, so they're, they're kind of cool and complementary. Um, so they are in ENB 201, I think. So that's just downstairs. Um, 201, yeah. I don't know where 201 is, but it's on the second floor. Um, but it's like 23 minutes in, but it, um, they do like these competitive programming competitions as well, um, where you can try to test out your skills and also, uh, you know, really kind of hone in on your programming skills. So um, that's all I got. Anybody got any questions? Okay. Um, yeah. Again, like this, this stuff is it's hard crap. I mean, um, anybody who's you know, any amount of decent at it right now started at zero. Um, uh, you know, like I started at zero, started coming to learn how to learn some of the stuff. Um, I don't know, Kevin, what was it like for you? Oh, it was rough. It was I mean, rough. get it and it's fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it just takes time, practice, and um, and just mess around with stuff. So, but yeah. Um, hope to see you guys tomorrow. Thanks for coming out. Yeah. Hey, can you uh, just run by me like all of the um, <clears throat> channels on uh, Slack that you guys have? Oh yeah. So you can ask, you can view all the channels. So if you go to um, this channel button, um, you can view uh, all these channels. Um, you probably won't see some of the ones with locks, but um, you can preview each one, um, and it'll show you the, the topic. <coughs> Um, and I think, see more details. Yeah, it'll give you a purpose and a topic, so you can figure out what that channel is for. Um, and then, yeah, just anything that you think would have conversations that you're in interested in. Um, you gotta edit this. Where did you say that you posted the slides at? And which channel? Um, the slides, yeah, in exploitation meeting, yeah. Okay. Um, how do I edit the purpose? 5 p.m. 3 37. It's not Tuesday, it's Thursdays. Uh, that's not relevant. Um, uh, but this uh, this GitHub link, I put all of my um, any samples that I show. Uh, Oh, mine's during the meeting is there. And yeah, um, Kevin gave a couple talks last semester, and I hope he does again this semester. Uh, so um, yeah, just any like uh, actual demos or challenges or anything will go to that link. Um, yeah, just like the format stream. Anything else? Yeah. So what the CTF stand for exactly? Capture the flag. Um, so you familiar with like traditional capture the yeah. flag? Right. Um, so it's the same thing, except you're not stealing physical flags. Uh, you're getting programs to um, reveal secrets, or uh, you're getting programs to allow you to control them in ways you weren't supposed to control them, um, or you're breaking some cryptography or something, and then it'll give you a flag, which is basically a proof that you completed a challenge, and you submit, and it's just a string. Um, so a flag in in this sense, it's just a string of characters, and you submit that to an online board okay. um, to prove that you solved the challenge, and then you get points. Okay. Um, so it, it it's kind of like the answer to the challenge. Okay. If the challenge is a question. And how are they practice this exactly? So um, so there are a couple great links when the website's back up. Um, if you go there, uh, one of the tabs is new members. Um, so there's some great um, reference. There's some great uh, resources there. Uh, there's also a website called honeable.kr, uh, which uh, it, this one goes easy to hard. Um, and the first two or three challenges can be easy or medium, depending on um, what knowledge or trivia you have ahead of time. But it gets hard really fast. Uh, so there's also, um, on YouTube, there's a channel I really like called Live Overflow. Um, and if you sort his videos from oldest to newest, um, he has, he's numbered a bunch of his videos, and if you watch them in order, the first 10 or 15 of them are really great for getting started. Um, 
and he literally starts with how to use Python, how to use C, how to use the terminal. That's that's awesome. Yeah. So hmm. they so added two new challenges. It's a good start really? point. Yeah. Uh, what else? Oh, there's um, uh, if you Google uh, Bandit warping. Oh, over the wire. Over the wire. Yeah, exactly. Um, that gets you started with uh, some of the basics of like the command line foo um, that you might need. Um, anybody else have some good resources? Um, oh, there's, this is a really simple one, but it's uh, uh, it's one we played at the uh, boot camp uh, that we did for high school students, and it's. Hack this website is a vulnerable website that um, you unlock the you you complete a challenge and unlock the next level by coding that web page in some sort of way. You send some string that you know exploits some. I don't know. I don't, I don't remember what the challenges were like for that, but I think I think they start out doing. That. Terminus is the one that's for we did for high school students that just teaches you the command lines. It's a really nice intro. It's got a cool like adventure game style to it, mm -hmm. like a story and stuff. So it's good. Um, one really great resource, especially if you're working on some public challenge and you're just kind of stuck on something, is uh. Channel. Um, yeah, if you're like working on a pwnable um, challenge and you're like, I got to this point, but I can't figure out like what to do after that, just ask. Um, there are like 200 people in there, and one of them is going to be willing to give a hint or something. Um, yeah, and CTFs, just playing CTFs, and then even if you can figure out what to do in a challenge, people will submit write-ups. Uh, like, oh, hey, here's how I solve this challenge. Um, so if you go to uh, ctftime.org, um, the f one of the first things you'll see, if you scroll to the bottom, is just the newly submitted write-ups. Uh, but you can also go to a specific CTF. Like, let's say, oh, I play Tokyo Westerns, and um, I go to event tasks and write-ups, and there's this one challenge called load. I want to read the write-ups for it. Um, so there's six write-ups available, and then they're just links. So I can click it. Uh, oh, this That's a really bad write-up. Um, let's go to the, the one with the 5.0 rating. Um, so this is a very in-depth write-up about how this guy solved the challenge. Um, so even if you can figure out what to do, just wait a few days after the end of the CTF and look for some write-ups. Um, that's that's one of the best ways because um, that'll like that'll show you what you could have done when you got stuck. So that like in the future, that's one less way to get stuck. So um, yeah. Anything else? All right. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Um,